to request it to our team uh, and just yes so we are live now so i think the ideas are good and lighting is also good am i audible yes yes sir you are uh, so, so we are going to start uh, assalam alaikum and good afternoon uh, everyone myself salahuddin bhutto currently i am chief coordinator at law student council today uh, we have a very informative session with versatile personality even my mentor uh, mr muslim bin akil today uh, we have a very informative session with muslim bin akil mr muslim did his llm in maritime law decided he is an advocate of high court based in islamabad he has also given his legal services in various international legal platforms he is also uh, a visiting faculty in national defense university so this was uh, a intro uh, of mr uh, muslim bin akil so sir uh, the stage is yours and i request you to continue this session uh, with blue economy and maritime law thank you very much uh, uh, mr bhutto for just giving me the platform to just discuss about the very important topic we are going to discuss today and that is about the blue economy and the maritime laws the very mm -hmm. first thing i would like to continue with is that uh, people over here don't know what is blue economy and why there are, is so much importance of the maritime laws before the mm -hmm. session commences and uh, um, just uh, uh, giving the information to my students that very first thing that when we were talking about the planet earth it is the 73% of water and it is 27% of the land and when i am talking about the international laws uh most of the people are like uh, curtailed they uh, just uh, uh, marginalize themselves towards uh, the land uh, based genocides and the conventions that has been ratified for the land but the most of the people are not looking for the part of the land that constitutes 73% of the planet that is uh the seas and the oceans and when we are saying uh, the maritime laws the maritime laws has its etymology from a uh, 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 the word mary that means the sea the definition of the maritime relating to the bordering on to the uh, maritime province relating uh, relating it to the navigations and the crimes that are happening over the seas um it is uh when we are uh, studying the international law either it is a humanitarian law it is a, uh, the energy laws the maritime laws they are the apex they are the top of uh, the laws when we are talking because it is the law that is going to govern the 80% of the world trade uh, that is uh, taking place through the sea it constitutes around uh, 14 trillion dollars a year amount of trade and when we are in a geography when we are in a strategic position like as of in pakistan and with the emergence of cpac where the initiatives of the blue economy where the resources of the seas have stayed untapped the uh, the importance of the maritime laws must be highlighted so we can invite our students towards this field this domain that has remained untapped uh, into the uh, legal uh, daily course so when we are talking about the maritime laws uh, let's know about uh, the father of the international laws and the international legislation and the father of the maritime laws and uh, his name is uh, Hugo Grotius and uh, he wrote a lot about uh, the freedom of the navigation and the freedom of the seas and the laws of the seas when we are talking about uh, the uh, united conventions on the laws of seas uh, there is a whole set uh, that has been ratified by the different uh, states and uh, that united nations convention on laws of seas is uh, discussing and is describing the modus operandi and the legislation and the litigation and the modes through which those litigations take uh, take place at sea so um, before uh, coming uh, towards the international law uh, laws domain uh, let me give you a quite slight insight of the maritime laws of uh, why we use the maritime laws uh, in order to use the freedom to use the world's maritime water is one of the oldest customary principles of the international maritime law there there has been a word that is called the lex maritima and in international law and lex mercatoria that is directly correlated towards the maritime laws when we are talking about the lex lex means the law and the maritima means the maritime affairs and uh, it refers to a body of the oral rules written rules 
customs usages and relating to the navigation of the maritime commerce taxation and the maritimes uh, how it developed in the medieval era and uh, believe you me uh, uh, because the people doesn't have much knowledge about it but until 1950s the only bifurcation of the sea that was known was between the territorial sea and the high seas uh, before using any terminologies that is related to the maritimes let me uh, just convey the informations disseminate the information towards my students who are listening and who are you know, watching our program that we can bifurcate the sea into some zones like for example first of all we have internal waters that is towards internal waters the body of waters that is land towards from the baseline in the same way like to the 12 nautical miles 12 nautical miles is basically the unit to measure the distance uh, while we are uh, uh, traveling the sea when 12 nautical miles from the baseline it's your territorial waters first internal waters then territorial waters then to 24 nautical miles it is the contagious zone and after 24 nautical miles to 200 uh, nautical miles is the exclusive economic zone and after the exclusive economic zones we have the high seas united nations convention on laws of the seas and others uh, other laws of laws of i must say uh, the maritime laws uh, uh, give us the insight that how the law operates in different uh, different zones either it is the high seas it is the exclusive economic zone where we can provide the innocent passages to different vessels or uh, till what extent of the zone we can go for the mineral and uh, uh, the resource uh, the sea based resource exploration and uh, in the same way uh, what liabilities duties and jurisdictions we do have in our territorial zones and the internal waters so um, talking about the trade volume it is 11.08 billion tons by volume and 14 trillion dollars of trade as a cash amount that is taking place at the sea that makes it the most top notch uh, uh, sector of the law that is the maritime like for example it is it is 80 to 85% of this trade that is happening through the seas and then it is uh, the carriage of international carriage of goods that is taking place by rails and then roads and believe you me that it is the least that is 2% of the carriage that is uh, taken away from one place one port of the uh, to the other port of the destination it is only 2% the most of the uh, trade that is being conducted at the sea is uh, from the ship and uh, through the containers we, we uh, if it is a ship we uh, ship that is carrying the crude oil we call them vlcc very large crude oil containers in the same way like there are uh, uh if uh, th th there are multitask uh, tasking ship or like uh, we can so i don't want to go into the terminologies that is uh, uh, one is called the roll on roll off ship and uh, cruise shipping so these are the things um right talking about the states that which states uh, in maritime are the powerful maritime states the powerful maritime states claim and exercise effective control over large expanses of the sea asserting their jurisdiction if um, being a student of international relations then uh, being a student of international law and now teaching international law i have seen that the states who have effective maritime laws and who have explored their seas to the best are the ones that are the most developed of the states pakistan has a huge uh, volume and uh, it's it, uh, it has a thousand miles of it, the thousand kilometers of the coastal line and uh, since yet we haven't explored the resources to the much like only talking about a small sector of the fisheries that if we regulate our fisheries in our internal waters and territorial waters we can add up to like 400 to 500 million dollars into our foreign reserves and that means booming the pakistan's economy so after in the lecture if there is any question you can pose right now and then afterwards i'll be moving towards the details of the lecture sir uh, like you have a recent uh... given uh, the uh, shipping and all uh, fisheries in a recent time i have read an article that pm imran khan uh, is also working on these shippings and uh, also blue economy to uh, promote the economic and gdp efforts what do you think like uh, how much pti government is over on it and how much they are working on it and how much uh, they have legislated uh, this maritime law uh, in pakistan it is Uh, indeed a very interesting question and uh, uh, since uh, being uh, with the uh, maritime affairs 
uh, I happened to work at a, a project that is the establishment of the island that Prime Minister Imran Khan is very much keen interested into building it. That is the uh, establishment of the Bandal and the Budu Island. Uh, Bandal and Budu Island, they are like 1.2 nautical miles south of the coast of the Karachi and uh, they are basically the mangrove uh, centuries and uh, they are the natural habitat for the green turtles and the mangroves that are the sources of the red carbon reserves. So the government of PTI uh, is on, uh, I'm not political and this is not my political uh, uh, answer. But I have seen that the political uh, uh, government of the PTI is very much concerned towards the tourism development. And for this reason, they are uh, very much serious about developing the islands and making, uh, 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 including the coastal communities, developing the coastal communities. And in uh, a short period of time, inshallah, you'll see that the coastal, along with the com coastal communities, there would be ferries that would be running from Gawada, Iran to Karachi and these uh, islands. Because uh, of uh, it is not about uh, about the political motivation. It is about the fact and the question of law. That yes, Pakistan. The fact is, Pakistan has remained unaddressed in terms of the maritime laws. And yes, the point is, we need to uh, address the lacunas and the lags we have in in this field. Uh, so, and to uh, this, the, uh, the best answer can come from the United Nations Conventions of the Laws of Seas because uh, it balances the rights and the obligations of the states. And uh, we can we can do a lot. For example, it is not only about the PTI government. It is about like we didn't do much and we need to do more. For example, talking about 2003, there was a Tasman, uh, Tasman Spirit Spillage. And uh, Pakistan could have uh, uh, taken billions of dollars for just polluting our marine environment by the oil spillage. But since we were un unaware of the Marpol conventions and the Civil Liability Conventions 92, and for this reason, we couldn't hold and we couldn't claim the damages uh, done by that task man spirit. Uh, so, is uh, Pakistan government and before that, uh, we have Pakistan Merchandise Shipping Ordinance 2001. Besides that, yes. we have any kind of uh, shipping laws in uh, present in Pakistan, uh, where uh, in, in a recent time, uh, like uh, the climate change issue in Pakistan is rising. Even uh, a few days ago, I have read the article, Pakistan is uh, like coming in the uh, top 10 uh, climate uh, disaster, climate change countries. So what do you think? Do you have any other laws uh, which be, uh, doing the business and by shipping way for uh, below economy? Uh, we have any ordinance or any law which cover these odd uh, things in Pakistan? Uh, to be very honest, uh, like, uh, yes, there are laws that have been legislated in Pakistan uh, and uh, they, are, they are there to support the maritime. Uh, if I can go through the list, I can go through it. Like, for example, uh, a few of them are Karachi Port Trust Act, that is 1886. Then we have Fisheries Act, that is 1897. Then we have the West Pakistan Fisheries Ordinance, that is 1961. Then we have the exclusive Fisheries Zone Regulation Fisheries Act of 1993, uh, Ports Act of 1908, Law of Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1925, and it includes uh, uh, Hague Rules, Hague Wisby, Wisby Rules, and the Rot uh, Rotterdam Rules. Then we have uh, the Port Qasim Authority Act, that is 1973. We have Pakistan Maritime Security Agency Act 1997, uh, Pakistan Merchant Shipping Ordinance 2001, you were just talking about. Then we have Marine Insurance Act 2017. We have the Joint Maritime Information Act 2019. And that is about the JMCC Joint Maritime Cooperation Center that has been established by Pakistan Maritime Security Agency and Pakistan Navy in order to cater all those perils, all those, in order to save all those people who have been stuck into the perils at the sea. And uh, in addition to that, there are 32 instruments uh, that have been rectified and ascended by Pakistan towards uh, the International Maritime Organization, that is the IMO. Uh, so, sir, uh, in a recent time, uh, India is also uh, coming towards shipping business, uh, and pa the Pakistan PTI government is also working on it. Uh, but exactly. uh, should, should, should we look into the climate change issue? Uh, like in Bangladesh, uh, the world la largest uh, ship breaking is over there. And uh, there's a many climate change issue rising in Bangladesh. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, we have also that kind of issue. So uh, what do you think? Do, uh, do uh, the government of Pakistan have highlighted uh, these issues in an international manner or in international legislation, uh, something like that? 
definitely uh, pakistan uh, these these uh, you can say these are the maritime industries like either it is a ship building or it is a ship breaking or it is a ship repair these are the more of like uh, maritime industries uh, in which the government of pakistan is highly keen and is highly doing a lot of job that is well commendable uh, for example like if talking about the maritime uh, ship breaking bangladesh is at the top in pakistan we yes we are into the ship building uh, ship breaking capacity and what i believe to my extent as a pakistani i believe that pakistan and should be participating in ship building industry to that can generate a large large amount of revenue for them and apart from uh, it uh, like uh, when you have to are talking about the climate change the word blue economy the blue itself uh, denotes to the notion of sustainability that uh, like for example it is the sustainable development and goal uh, goal 14 uh, or 16 probably that is talking about the sustainable exploitation of the resources underneath the water the water body so the blue economy me the concept of uh, uh, blue economy and its emergence in pakistan the development of the maritime sector the uh, the department of the maritime sector uh, the ministry of maritime affairs was pre uh, previously known as the ministry for port and shipping and since uh, the names have been changed to the maritime affairs and then the blue economy the basic essence to this is to uh, impart the sustainable development uh, of the resources and keeping those resources in a safe manner so we can uh, save them for our future generations that is the vision of pakistan and pakistan navy but i'm not the spokesperson so but but yes they have a very good intention and yes uh, they are doing a lot to uh, bring the uh, development towards the waters of pakistan because uh, uh, talking about the waters it is the matter of national security now because when you see uh, pakistan has recently conducted aman exercise that was the aman 21 that was basically meant to give the impression that pakistan is a more responsible maritime state and pakistan can do a lot in terms of catering to the piracy and pakistan can provide the safe passages to the trades that are passing through the south asian regions or at least near uh, the pakistan and its regions uh, sir coming to the blue economy Uh, in a recent time, uh, UNO and other uh, climate change activists are working on the blue economy. So, uh, in in the present time, uh, what our government uh, has started initiatives and uh, kindly let us know about uh, what is uh, blue economy. Firstly, because uh, indeed it was also uh, new for me to know. I am very keen to know about it. And then just go uh, for the blue economy. What initiatives were uh, taken by? Uh, PTI government or the present government on below term. Uh, just uh, just before the meeting, I uh, uh, I happened to know that the Minister for Maritime Affairs, Minister Ali Hader Zadi, had a meeting with the uh, Shaukat Tarin, who is uh, uh, dealing with the economics of Pakistan. So let me tell you, uh, initiating from the very basic, because uh, yes, I do agree. I cannot agree with you more. In fact, Salahuddin, that uh, uh, the econ, the blue economy, uh, the red carbon. these are the novel concepts that the, in pakistan uh, the people don't know much and yes it is not it is our duty and it is not uh, like this that we want to keep this knowledge toward uh, to to us only the more we have lawyers like you the more enthusiasts and the more dynamic and the vibrant personalities like you salman and the people who are watching it i believe that uh, uh, not far are those days that the blue economy concepts could not be achieved coming to the blue economy actually maritime economy is called the blue economy so when we were discussing about uh, the program i told you that oh, when we were discussing about the maritime laws and we don't discuss and tap the blue economy or the maritime economy it would be unjustified with the topic so blue economy includes all the interlinked activities related to the oceans sea coast inland waters carried out in a sustainable manner we were talking about the use of word blue is primarily to put the focus on the oceans used to emphasize the sustainable environment friendly aspects of the oceans and the seas uh the person who tossed uh, the word blue economy his name was gunter paul and is uh, he tossed this word in back in 2004 in uh, uh, in uh, uh, an initiative that was named as zeri zeri in action zero emission research initiative so uh how much it is concerned towards the climate change uh, uh, its origin its place where it got its introduction can just uh, give you the slightest of the idea blue economy uh, is uh, discussed at the different levels even at the levels of the united nations and uh, united nation conference on trade and development uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, and like you can say the world bank the european commission the commonwealth the Euro uh, united nations environment and the united nations the department of economic and social affairs they all have defined the blue economy so um, if it is convenient for you i can just uh, um, tell you the definitions how they have defined and how they have marginalized these this topic the united nation conference on trade and development says that the oceans economies is the concept of an oceans economy also embodies economic and trade activities that integrate the conservation and sustainable management of biodiversity including marine ecosystem and the genetic resources this is uh, what have, blue economy has been defined by united nation uh, uh, conference on trade and development similarly uh, the world bank has defined as uh, in back in uh, united nation 2017 that blue economy is the potential and the potential of blue economy states the concept to seek number one, to promote economic growth the social inclusion and the preservation or improvement of the livelihood while at the same time ensuring the environmental sustainability of the oceans and the coastal areas you must be noticing that they are ensuring the sustainability that is the sdg sustainable developmental goals that the whole world is focusing for its development and preserving things for the future generations the european commission back in 2018 uh, stated that all economic activities related to the oceans seas and coasts and the wide range of interlinked businesses to these basics uh, uh, seas coast and the ocean and other emerging sectors are included in the concept of blue economy the commonwealth states that the blue economy is an emerging concept that encourages better stewardship of our oceans blue resources it supports all the united nations sustainable developmental goals that is sustainable developmental goal 14 that we were talking about that is life below the water and recognizes that this will require ambitious coordinated actions to sustainably manage protect and preserve our oceans in the same way united nations environment program is the world's leading program that is looking into the international environment assess assessment activities that uh, what are the environmental hazards that are going to cater us in establishing uh, the safer climate and they have stated it in collaboration with the economic and social affairs of the united nations that blue economy moves beyond the business as a usual model to regard economic development and ocean health as compatible so these are the few definitions of the world uh, uh, world bank and the united nations and different commissions regarding to the united nations have uh, termed the blue economy and i hope so that these definition must have given you some uh, slight scope of uh, a slight idea of what blue economy actually is uh, talking about the blue economy and the industries relating to it uh, there are a few major industries and there are uh, major ones that are yet to be added but at the later stage once we initiate and make the basic developmental model then the others are yet to come number 1 it is the fisheries number 2 it is the marine transport number 3 it is the tourism number 4 is the renewable energy number 4 is the waste management and number 5 6 is the climate change that you mr slaudin were just talking about so talking about the fisheries uh, our students must know that uh, like when we are talking about the fisheries just on a very frank note people say that what is fisheries it's a small department like highly uh, uh, prone to development like and uh, that is uh, having a bad office bad furniture but no this is not fisheries we are talking about right now over here and when we discuss it in terms of maritime and uh, blue economy the fisheries marine fishery contributes over 270 billion dollars annually to the globe cross domestic product gdp 270 billion dollar annually talking about the marine transport 80% of the goods are traded internationally are transported by sea the volume of trade sea bond is expected to double by 2030 uh, and uh, quadruple it go, it's going to it's going to get four times by 2050 tourism now talking about the tourism that you were uh, uh, correlating with the present contemporary government of the pakistan tehreek and saf the tourism tourism ocean and coastal tourism provide job and help the economy to flourish small island development uh, the small island states that we call as archipelagic states uh, 
more than 41 million visitors visit them per year. And when we are talking about the concept of the uh, Pakistan Tariq and Saab, that they said that they are going to provide with the 5 million jobs, only tapping the blue resources in Pakistan, developing our coastal lines uh, and coastal communities and the, the sea up to the levels of the exclusive economic zones, we can generate more than uh, 10 million of the jobs easily in the very second year of the projects. The Prime Minister says he's going to give you 50 lakh jobs. I say if you develop the maritime sector, you can easily get to have one crores of the job opportunities and you can easily cater the uh, problem of the un unemployment that is drastically um, destroying, diminishing our youth to uh, like you can just eradicate unemployment from Pakistan if you just uh, forget the political uh, maneuverings they do uh, uh, like the 18th Amendment fact that the provinces are uh, in their autonomy and they cannot allow the federal to come and uh, get to some uh, billion dollar project. So we have to think as a nation <clears throat> on the same page that what we can do as uh, a Pakistani, as a politician for the betterment of our good, for our people and our nation. So this is uh, about the traditional industries that the blue economy is uh, running through. Um, now coming to the contribution of the trade, commerce, and the resources. But if you want to pose a question before that, you can. So the recent question, uh, the recent thing which we have raised, uh, uh, again, amendment and the provisional government and the federal government. Uh, so the, in the recent, uh, the federal government has just introduced an artisan on the islands, the islands of the uh, Karachi and Sin. So they were thinking that we were going to uh, bring up some international projects on that island. But uh, the Sindh government, uh, which we say People's Party, has just uh, denied that kind of ordinance and then just uh, give the slogans of nationality that they are going to uh, just making the rights of Sindhi people and Sindhi nation. So, uh, what do you think, like uh, these some uh, diplomatic steps which were taken by different uh, political parties of Pakistan, uh, this can ruin our nation, uh, uh, like you said. Um, many job sectors and tourism and many other things. Uh, since we're uh, talk, talking about this 18th Amendment, since uh, I have been working with, uh, there was an authority that was established by the federal government, but the steps that were taken that was uh, that, that an ordinance was passed regarding the Pakistan island development. So there is a there, there is a time for the uh, uh, ordinance to get labs that is 120 days and after 120 days that thing gets uh, uh, that ordinance uh, is lapsed so what the project was and still it is and it is not expired it is a 50 billion dollar project it was proposed by thomas karmer he is the same developer who has developed the miami beach of the florida and he said that i am going to develop this whole thing this whole island and i believe Believe me, that uh, is going to be a bigger hit than the Dubai that you have in your uh, uh, on on your western side, southwest. So, uh, when it came to be fifty billion dollars, it was a huge amount. Uh, a sport was taken uh, just to break down the project. That uh, there were other incentives. For example, if I tell you this thing, that there are many illegal jetties in Karachi, that there are many illegal jetties in Karachi, that there are the local uh, person has, who are the influencer over, over there and who have some resources, they get the people and ask them to visit, visit the sea for two to three months for like, a, uh, for like one lakh, two lakhs or three lakhs. But when they uh, come back with their catch, that catch is worth more than millions. And uh, since they don't have uh, such knowledge about it, so they get exploited and without getting into the tax net, they, uh, there's a word I use you. That is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. For this reason, uh, there is a 1,000% profit to the person who's sending that person to the uh, ocean or the sea to catch the fish. And that thing is not getting into the tax net, uh, net and somehow it is, uh, benef uh, it, it is like contributing towards the political incentives of the local government. For this reason, they don't want uh, the authority to be established because everything would get under the check and balance stuff and which they are reluctant to do but yes uh 18 talking about the 18th amendment 
yes they are the provincial autonomy has been given there is a, the autonomy of like uh, expense expenditure and uh, administering the things within their domains but there is one thing more i uh, i want to add that uh, these two islands we are talking about let's say we are not building these but if we say that we want to build on these islands these two islands come under the port kasim authority and the port kasim authority comes under the federal ministry of the maritime affairs but yet we don't want any kind of uh, disrupt or any kind of uh, a lag between the provincial and the federal governments so if you call come up with a constitution of pakistan they say that the federal uh, 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 government can utilize the things of the province in order they'll have to pay the amount and the resources to the provincial government this is the article of the constitution that says about it right rather uh, those islands are not even rest newly as that no one owns them but we want an amicable dispute resolution settlement of the dispute between the federal uh, federation and the provincial governments so it will take some time but this is a, a big project and it totally relies on the fact that how much we spread the awareness because the people living over there uh, the coastal communities they have been fishing like for thousands of years and it is like uh, uh, a narrative that is being built there that they are being abridged of their basic rights or the things that their forefathers used to do 5000 years back now if there would be a development or there would be trawlers or there would be buildings so their fish catch might reduce but this is not the fact this is not going to happen uh, this is only the propaganda and as being students of law me you and we all have a very huge responsibility of like uh, sharing the concept that it is not how maritime is going to uh, help pakistan to develop out of the economical constraints uh, so sir besides we have uh, some question in the comment section so uh, let us go through here and the, uh, the first question we have uh, what is the Salahuddin, uh, there is a disruption in your voice. I cannot hear you. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, there were some questions in the comment section. Uh, yes, from, please. Uh, the members of Law Student Council and also the Am Awam have their questions. So uh, the first question is from Mr. Soe. That what are the rights of landlocked states? talking about the landlocked states landlocked states have all the rights uh, to establish their installations uh, in in the sea the united convention convention on the laws of seas is very much uh, highlighting the fact that the landlocked uh, states can make up their islands or they can get their installations done at the high seas they deem feasible landlocked states have the same um, the rights as uh, the coastal states to have but yes they are um, uh, they are not available with the internal waters the territorial contagious or exclusive zones exclusive zones yeah for example uh, talking about one of the most heinous uh, uh, attempts uh, that like you can say is the crime that uh, mostly takes uh, place over uh, uh, the seas is the piracy let me tell you about the piracy that piracy is a transnational crime and uh, it refers to those self perpetuating association of individuals who operate transnationally for obtaining power influence monetary or other commercial gains wholly or in part by illegal means while protecting their activities through a pattern of corruption and violence according to united nation convention on the laws of the seas article 101 states that piracy consists of any illegal act of violence or detention or any act of attack committed for the private ends any act of voluntarily participation within the operation of a ship or an aircraft with the knowledge of the fact making it a pirate ship or aircraft any act of inciting intentionally facilitating the activities mentioned are also included in the piracy the point is the piracy is a transnational crime the it is not only the flag state uh, or the flag carrying vessel that is going to prosecute it the other states if have the uh, uh, if if have the news if have the update of like the piracy has been being done at the nearest high high sea so they have all the rights to go and uh, execute the task and uh, make that piracy mission a failure and they can be prosecuted they can be 
um they can be uh, prosecuted anywhere at any place of the land they have pirates have no nationality and since it's a transnational crime there is no limitation there is no bar over the uh, the place and jurisdiction of their execution so sir uh, coming to the last one uh, but but uh, yes in- but yes but but yes there is one thing i want to add if that same act of like which we term as piracy is being conducted uh, is is being conducted in the exclusive economic zones or in the internal waters or in the contagious zone it would be termed as robbery and it will be dealt accordingly to the jurisdictional local laws prevailing laws we have in that time of that state Uh, so sir coming to the uh, last one uh, which uh, really i want to know uh, people are interested in mental law and they just go to uh, higher studies in that kind of field so what would you suggest them uh, to go in that field and what are the opportunities for a student uh, to go in that uh, field to work in a legal forum okay perfect perfect a very good question and uh, i think today today's program is motivated uh and is uh, empowered to enlighten our students to join the maritime laws the word is international admiralty and maritime laws this is the whole term and why should you come every aspect of the law is good either it is civil it is criminal it is corporate it is maritime it is whatever you do but when you are doing when you are trying to get into the corporate field when we say that it is it is trade it is the dispute resolution so 80% of the trade is happening at the sea it is a matter of national security the peers, the students of the international relations since i myself has been the student of international relations so i i ought to have my interest in this i i wanted to do the best corporate uh, dealings i wanted to uh, do a transnational international practice for uh, for to me that international maritime laws was uh, best suiting and with the emergence of china pakistan economic corridor and the belt and road initiative the uh, the admiralty lawyers are uh, there are very few admiralty lawyers across the world i i must say there are uh, there are, are around no one uh, in pakistan if i say who are doing this but yes uh, since being a lawyer you can practice anything but specialization is a different thing but once you do specialization you have the knowledge of what committee maritime international says what world trade organization says how the trade and development is running across the world how bill of ladings are prepared how ports are operating and how dry ports are uh, giving you the things like if there is a trade deficit and um, there there has been something that you have uh, called on or you have imported from the other country and that it gets confiscated and like, literally after 45 days the customs authority are uh, uh like auctioning it then what you remedies do you have so i would suggest every law of, of my law student that before getting in the admission the pakistan's uh, admiralty jurisdiction of high court 1980 they must read it so they come to know that how pakistan is dealing with the admiralty issues either it is the ship arrest it is the aircraft arrest it is uh, the air crash incident either it is pk 8303 or the air blue and how we are going to execute the damages out of them so these are uh, and yes corp- in the corporate field maritime is the most intellectual field the more you know about international relations the more you know about the economics the more you know about the law the more you know about the travelings the more you know about the air the uh, more you know about the air space the more you know about the water territories the uh, the more you know about the exploitation the more you want to get into the governance and the policy making of the country so if you are that kind of person i must say that uh, i bet that you, if you come to maritime laws you are going to enjoy it very much uh, well sir this topic is like uh, uncountable to discuss and unlimited to discuss we will end up our session over here and we hope that you will join us in the next session uh, after eid or in and coming our events so till that uh, thank you very definitely. much आपने टाइम निकाला हमारे लिए हमारे लिए इस स्टूडेंट के लिए और एंडी एक ये नया टॉपिक था मेरे लिए और यहाँ पे हर एक लिसनर के लिए कि मेरन टाइप लॉ एक बड़ी फील्ड है जिसमें काम हो सकता है और हर कोई जा सकता है बिफोर वी एंड ऑफ द सेशन बिफोर वी एंड ऑफ द सेशन 
let me tell my, my tell uh, tell my uh, law students that the biggest corporate incident that could have taken place was the Swiss Canal blockage. Yes, 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 indeed. Uh, I just missed it. And uh, that was name supposed name. to be, and that was supposed to be sorted out through maritime laws, through the York and Twerp rules, the laws of the general average, and in the same way. Uh, there was a case uh, like uh, many of you have seen. I was a principal counsel in it. It was about the MP IBA and the uh, passengers that were stranded there for four years. Each of them had three, uh, three, uh, three lakh dollars of the wages that were unpaid, and they were stranded for four years. The worst of the kind humanitarian crisis. I talked to Madam Shiri Mazadi, the Honorable Minister for uh, Human Rights, and uh, Ali Hader Zadi and Prime Minister Imran Khan, who were keen. Uh, uh, keen enough to sort out this issue and I'm also thankful to the Council of Welfare Atashi, uh, Community Welfare Atashi for uh, doing this thing and executing that person, uh, Riyasat Ali, for, uh, like, who was stranded for, there for four years. So this is what a maritime lawyer do. This is what we expect from the law students of Pakistan. This is not uh, the lawyers are uh, meant to just sit in the court and uh, getting from the bar room and not learning. Uh, I'm thankful to all my lawyer colleagues, my seniors, my mentors, uh, who mentored us in this way. And we are there to mentor our students to the possible extent we can. Uh, so, sir, uh, till date, uh, we have to end up our session because uh, the time is over. And uh, we are very thankful for your time for our platform. And indeed, it's an honor for us that uh, we just have you. Or inshallah, in uh, upcoming session, uh, we will have you again. So till then, thank you. Thank you very much.